I'm in the process of developing a Z80 based computer system. In the video so far in this series I've gone through the development of a video output system and I'm using discrete uh, gate level logic for this uh, design. I'm trying to keep as much to the uh, kind of historical aspect of this as I can so I'm trying to use uh, parts that were available when the Z80 first uh, was released so I'm trying to avoid CRT controls that sort of thing so I've gone through the video uh, design and I've also been through the uh, core processor uh, part of the system and put together a fairly basic uh, central working part for that I'm uh, ordering some boards I've actually ordered some boards now for that part of the circuit that's the circuit we looked at in the previous two videos um, and while I'm waiting for those boards to turn up I thought we'd turn our attention to the uh, second board I've had made up for this project the first board was the small board for the DRAMs to tidy up some of the breadboard uh, jumpers and uh, the second board is basically turning this and putting this into a single board now this board actually has quite a lot more on uh, in terms of electronics than the breadboard and um, while I'm on that topic uh, I've had a couple of comments in the previous videos about um, different types of RAM and uh, uh, bits missing off the circuits that sort of thing um, I should point out this is not a retrospective I'm not here recapping on something I've already designed I'm taking you through the process of development so I don't have the finished machine designed yet you're seeing it as I develop it as much as I can I'm kind of jumping back and forth a little bit because of course I do have to wait several weeks for the boards to turn up and I don't want you having to uh, hang around while that happens so I'm kind of uh, jumping back and forth and overlapping this a little bit um, but one of the things when you're developing systems like this complex uh, high-speed electronics you can only go so far with breadboards because they start getting bigger and bigger as the design grows and the bigger the breadboard layout the more problematic it becomes um, the number of jumpers the physical size all start to uh, create problems so I tend to leave parts of the circuit I don't absolutely need and uh, one of the comments was that one of the circuits wouldn't uh, work uh, for a particular reason um, well actually it would work it's um, there's a, I think there was a slight misunderstanding on the part of the commenter as to how that particular circuit worked in conjunction with the type of DRAM I was using and uh, also uh, I'm not going to start branching off talking about individual um, subtopics such as different types of DRAM that sort of thing otherwise we'd never get this project finished but if there's any aspect of this design that you are particularly interested in such as the types of DRAM different ways of driving DRAM then please leave a comment and if there's enough interest I'll do a completely separate video series on that but this series is about the development process it's not even really about this particular design it's about the mythology in going through and developing something like this breaking it down into individual steps rather than looking at a very complex system uh, overall right from the start so we're going through this step by step and hopefully it will start making more sense as we go through it but just bear in mind some things might change I might have to add bits or tape bits away because it is a work in progress and until um, it works until I put together the circuits and they do what they're supposed to uh, all bits are off so um, as I say you're going to see um, exactly what happens warts and all so if I plug something in and it catches fire then uh, you're going to see that on the video so that said uh, we'll now uh, look at this particular board so as you can see I've assembled one of the boards it's fundamentally what was on this breadboard and this is um, what I showed in the earlier videos for the video out um, but I have added some uh, things to this they are too complex to put onto the breadboard for reasons I've just explained but uh, one of the main things I've added to this is this circuit um, there's also some control logic off the bottom of this um, but what we've got here is the SRAM which was in the original uh, circuit that's on the breadboard we've got this latch which is also on the uh, breadboard and we'll start now to make more sense as to why it's there uh, because 
everything uh, else you've seen so far you don't actually need this latch to be there at all uh, and then we've got the uh, character ROM the shift register so these are all what were in the original design but what I've added are these three multiplexers and this bi-directional buffer and as I said there is some control logic at the bottom that you can't see on this um, but what this is for is while the circuit I showed would display what was in the um, SRAM it interpreted the values in the SRAM and looked up their character maps within the character ROM and it shifted those out bit by bit onto the display um, but one thing we couldn't do is actually write to the RAM or read from the RAM which the CPU is going to need to be able to do so the, in the address inputs to this SRAM were connected directly to the counters that kind of run through the uh, count for rows, pixels, columns, that sort of thing select the appropriate address within the SRAM and then shift that out onto the screen and uh, what we needed to do was kind of uh, split that, put some multiplexers there so that we can select either the output from the counters or the main address bus from the CPU and then to send data through to the SRAM we also needed this buffer and so we can select it when we're writing from the CPU to the SRAM and then data flows through from the left to the right as we're looking at it here and if we want to read from the SRAM then we do the reverse and then data flows from the right to the left at the address that's been selected by the CPU so it adds a bit of complexity but it means that in theory at least uh, with this board we should now be able to write to the uh, SRAM that's um, fitted and we should be able to modify the characters the screen is displaying so as I said this there is more to this um, circuit and I will show more of the circuitry in a future video but I don't want to show too much now uh, partly because I don't know if it works yet and secondly because um, I want to keep some of this for future uh, videos just to make the series a bit more interesting okay so I've got the circuit made up I'll just get the camera a bit closer so you can see it a bit more clearly so what we've got on here is the circuit as we had it on the breadboards a few small changes I've made to it but fundamentally it's the same we've got the multiplexers and then we've got the bi-directional buffer one thing you may be able to just about see is I've got one of the pins raised on the SRAM and that's not because there's an error on the board that's bit 8 the 8th bit of the data coming out of the SRAM and if you recall from the previous videos that bit is being used as a cursor control bit but until I can sensibly write to all the locations within the SRAM um, I don't want the uh, the characters being inverted as if though there was a cursor because uh, there's just random garbage in the SRAM when we power this up and um, with there being random uh, bits set for the 8th bit we were getting kind of hundreds of cursors on the screen which made it hard to look at and hard to determine what was going on so I've raised this pin and that has the effect of um, effectively disabling the cursor and that way we can see the underlying characters a lot more clearly um, but once we get the ability to write to all the screen locations then um, I'll obviously put that pin back in and we'll be able to then start displaying a proper cursor I've also got a jumper on the back of this board a wire link just so that we can double up the display um, so when I I'm going to try and write some characters manually to the SRAM and so that we can see more of the characters being displayed on the screen I've effectively defined the screen into two blocks just to make it a bit easier to do um, but normally we'd obviously write to one character at a time this just means that we can write to two character positions at the same time albeit in different parts of the screen um, other than that this is just laid out as in a standard uh, way there are four jumpers on here one enables the uh, external invert signal so the CPU can invert the signal wants to select a different character set within the character ROM and the other two are for the read and write control uh, for the uh, SRAM so 
Um, I'll get this powered up and we'll see what appears on the monitor screen. I will also look at the scope. The scope is connected to the horizontal drive, vertical sync and the video out. So we'll see how those uh, signals look and then we'll move across and look at the display on the monitor. Okay, so I'll power this up and switch on the clock. I'm driving this from the signal generator again because at the moment of course we don't have the CPU running so we'll power up the board and I'm going to turn the signal generator on and see what we get on the scope. Okay that's looking good. We have the horizontal drive which is the yellow trace, we have the vertical sync which is the blue trace and then we have the video out which is the purple. If we try zooming in we can see that the horizontal um, drive is looking good so there's obviously one of these per line and then if we zoom in further we can actually see the data that's been displayed so not only that but we can also see that we have overscan so if you recall from the previous videos we carry on scanning beyond the end of the line and that's to allow the monitor time to retrace and I said it is a significant proportion of the overall time. You can see that here how much of the time is actually the retrace and the rest of the, the low period here is the actual video data. You can see the individual bits being sent to the screen. So that appears to be doing what it should, nice and stable and I'll move the camera across now so you can see the monitor and you see what's coming out of it. And as you can see, we're getting a very nice clear display. This tube is in fairly poor condition. It's quite dim and there's a lot of screen burn. But even so, you can see we're getting a very nice proportioned square image. It's very nicely timed. The top row is the same height and width as the bottom row. Uh, yes, there are the correct number of columns uh, and rows. I have counted them. Uh, ignore the uh, flickering and the bands you're seeing, that is just the camera shutter. It's uh, very stable in real life and you can't normally see that. So what I want to do now is see if the extra circuitry I put onto this board actually work. And so what I'm going to do is select address 0, which is the top left hand or should be the top left hand character if we haven't messed up the, uh, the counters. And this is quite an important part of the test. If there's something wrong with the way that this circuit's arranged and the way that the counters and timers etc have been configured we won't be writing to the per, uh, correct part of the display so I want to try and change that top left hand character and what I'm going to do is move the I've got some jumpers on the input to that board I've got jumpers on the uh, data lines and I've got jumpers on the address lines the address lines are set for uh, address 0 and if I move the first jumper from the data line 0 up to the positive realm, then nothing should change straight away. But when I now strobe the right signal, you should see the character at the top left hand corner of the screen change to an uppercase A, which is the value um, in the character ROM for a value of 1, which is what we've currently now set on the address on the data bus. Okay, so I'm going to strobe it now. And I don't know if you can actually see it or not, but it has indeed changed to an uppercase A, which is very promising. What I'm going to do now is change the address to the next address up. So I'm going to change address line 0, so that we're looking at address 1. And now the second character, when I strobe the right line again, should change. And indeed it has changed. I'm not sure if you can see that on the screen. So we're looking up here. So we've now got two A's where we had two random characters before. I'm going to move the second jumper on the data bus. We're going to put a value of 3 onto the data lines. The address is still set to a value of 1, which is the second address, the second character. And now when I strobe it, we should get a uppercase C showing on the screen. And indeed we are. So now we're seeing A and C at the top left hand corner of the screen. Uh, the reason it's flickering of course is because um, when I'm taking the uh, right line low, the control logic on the board, 
is changing the configuration of the multiplexers and the uh, data buffer so that we can send data to the SRAM. That means it can no longer send the data from the counters through to the SRAM. And so you're getting this flickering. Now normally this would um, be gated to be done uh, during the refresh. If you recall, the refresh effectively extends off the visible portions of the display. And so if I gate the right signal to the horizontal refresh period, then it can refresh the SRAM and change the value read or write the value without it causing the display to flicker. Uh, but that's something we'll do in a future video when we get the CPU to start writing to the memory. So let's move the camera back. So it would appear that our video system is working the way it's supposed to. We can display the contents of the SRAM. Very nice looking display and now we can write and in theory at least read. There's no reason why the read shouldn't work but I haven't tried that yet. Um, because it's a transient thing I'll need to hook up the logic analyzer to test that. Uh, but it, it is looking quite promising. It, uh, we can successfully change the characters on the screen and importantly they are in the correct locations so the characters for address 0, address 1 are in the correct position on the screen at the top left hand corner and then the second character along as we increment the addresses. We're getting the correct value showing for the uh, correct data input. We started off with a value of one and that gave us the uppercase A, which it should have done. I then move the second jumper, so that gives us a binary value of three, which in this case should be C. And uh, again, that's what appeared on the screen. So it is looking as if though this circuit is working the way it's intended to. This won't be the final design for this. This is just a, a prototype test board so that I can test out the various circuits. And, but in theory, once we get the CPU running, we can now hook this up to the CPU and get the Z80 to start sending character data to the display. And once we get to that point, in theory, we can hook our Zax emulator to the uh, system and start writing some more meaningful test code and start sending something uh, more interesting to our display but it's looking promising so far if the CPU works once I've assembled it then our next step will be to hook these two together.